Hello, I'm Nigel Griffiths. I'm a technical person at IBM UK. It's early days for the new Power 10 S1024 machine. I have one and I've taken lots of pictures of it and I'll share those with you and make some comments as we go. Now you may have seen some other sessions or videos about the Power 10 chip itself, a lot of high tech functions in there, or even the Enterprise E1080 that's been out since September 2021. In this session though, we're gonna cover what the Power S1024 looks like, what are the major components, and we'll remove a lot of them to get a better view of them. I have the privilege of having an early S1024 machine as part of this early ship program that allows us to do all sorts of testing and preparation and building experience with the machines before they actually get announced and available to customers. But it may not be exactly what you're going to get when the machines go GA or generally available. So some testing hasn't been completed before my model was made. Uh, some labels may change, some handles may change color. I'm using early software, a bit of a problem because I have to keep upgrading it as new versions come out. Uh, some parts may be early parts and the packaging may not be finalized. But having said that, it's pretty much a solid machine as I can see and your machine should be pretty similar. At the bottom there, oh, it's IBM Confidential. Ah, oh, until officially announced. Well, it's been officially announced, so we're good. Quick reminder, the Power 9 servers, small, medium and large, scale out, mid-range and enterprise. They all arrived in 2018, apart from the AC922 that's used for AIM machine learning came out three months earlier. Also noted is power nine, uppercase letters, no space. And people that don't do it that way, just look like idiots in my humble opinion. And here's the power 10 machines, hooray! Small, medium, large, scalar, mid-range enterprise. So that makes life easier, we can work out what's what. Notice that the power 10 is lowercase letters now and no space. Please get it right. In the scale out machines, the important thing is we've got twice the number of cores, twice the amount of memory, and it's OMI memory, which is a lot faster. Similar for the E1050, but we're not going to cover that here. The scale out has two further models, the 1014 and the 1022S. They're cut down models of those primary two. Again, I'll be making other videos about the details and differences. So let's get into the pictures. Here's the server arriving on a pallet into the office. Check the labels, make sure it's yours and the one you're expecting. Uh, remove those black straps over the top and then remove these white clips on the sides and then you can lift the top of the box off in one go. Once you get inside, you'll find the rack rails and the cable management arm if you purchased one. There's also a lot of documentation. Just for laugh, in the early ship program, they sent us Power 8 documentation. The Power 10 documentation wasn't ready at the time, but it was a practice run. Inside, we can see uh, further foam to protect the server at the uh, bottom of the box. And take that out, and you can see you have a plastic wrapped up. You have to break this to get into the plastic bag to actually move it. So here is us moving the plastic out of the way. We've also moved the box undone the box and lifted it out of the way because we need to get hold of these handles to actually lift the box out. We can see here that it has further protection of the uh, computer on the front and the back with the uh, cardboard. While it's sitting there on the floor, I took pictures of the labels on the top. Very informative. I would spend a good five to ten minutes checking around each of these because there's a lot of information here that you may want early on and then you don't have to go to the documentation to find it if you know the details are on the top of the box. I zoomed in a little bit. This is the left-hand side that looks at the front, the storage and the NVMe storage adapters, some LCD display and the time of date battery. That's the bit over here. And then I zoom into the other side. This is when we lift the top. We're going to see all these components. You can see the numbering and what's what when you need them later on. So we lifted it onto our office desk for more photographing. This is optional. You don't have to take lots of pictures of your beautiful new S1024, but we did. So here's the look at the front and the back. This is protecting the adapter slots and things at the back. Uh, down in here, we got the uh, the green arrow highlighting the uh, handles that you use to lift the machine. Don't forget those electrostatic straps when handling anything that's inside the computer. Once it's on the desk and we've taken the cardboard off the front of the back, a quick picture, the top left one is not so good because of the sunlight behind, but a uh, quick look at the machine there and then the back of the machine is nicely lit again by the sunlight in the office space. So I took various pictures at various angles, so you have to make up your own mind which is the best picture. Of course, most of the action is around the back where all the connections are made for the power and communications. We'll be covering all this in great detail later. 
So I took a quick picture with Mr. Enmon uh, with the uh, new fancy computer, sent it off to Mrs. Enmon, and she wasn't that impressed, to be honest. She just asked, when are you getting home? Oh, well, some people get computers and some people don't. Here's a detailed look at the front. So I've labelled out what are the various things we can see in here. On our buttons indicators on the far left, we got four NVMe storage devices. Then in the middle, we have, uh, well, we don't have, this is where the optional LCD display goes here. We've got a blanking plate in ours, but I will show you a picture of the display later on. We have a USB memory key, for, uh, where you can put in a optional DVD drive if we want to boot off a DVD. And we have an earth strap connector on the far right. So here are the four NVMEs. There are, on the outside it says the SSDs. Well, they are SSDs, but they're connected rather than SAS. They're connected by NVMe, which is much, much faster. Also, we get questions every single day of the week about can I individually assign these NVMe storage devices to different LPARs or different virtual IO servers. And yes, they are each individually assigned to a partition like PCIe adapters, it's in one partition or another partition. Because I've got two different sizes in here, uh, I made a mistake, so avoid the mistakes that I make. I gave each virtual I/O server one small disk and one boot disk, and then I installed the I/O server perhaps on the small disk and tried to add the bigger disk to the volume group, and it won't let me do that because it's much bigger disk, twice the size, and it can't use the smaller PP size for the volume group. So always make sure that you have two disks the same size for your virtual I.O. server disks, and then you can mirror across them. If you've seen devices before in Power Systems, it's all exactly the same. Little blue uh, arrow at the top, you press that, it pulls out the little handle, grab hold of the handle, pull out the actual uh, SSD in this case. And then if we go on, it looks like a regular SSD. These are actually seven millimeter devices in a 14 millimeter caddy so we can actually have the 14 millimeters in the same machine as well putting it in slide it in until it's home then raise the handle up and it clicks in very simple to do if this was live this is on a desk right with no power if it was live you must be following the hmc driven nvme add remove or replace process on the hmc and it will tell you when to take it in and out and it will do a check on it when you put it back in that it looks like it's going to work Next we're going to have a more detailed look around the back of the machine. A lot of the heat comes out the air ducts at the back, some through the adapters, four power supplies down the middle, the eBMC service processor and the USB key. For removing the lid is quick and simple, just the same as power 8 and power 9. Press the blue triangle in the middle of the lid, lift the handle up as it comes over the top, the lid slides backward and disengages from the chassis. Now as we can see here, the flat head now needs to go into that slot in the chassis. Putting it back on is uh, fairly simple. First, that rubber lid front flange has to go underneath the, the server edge in the chassis. Line up the flat head nails with the L-shaped brackets and down goes the other end of the lid. And then you close the lid over the top. If you can't get it to fit, check that that little handle that disengages the lid is actually upright before it goes on, otherwise you won't get it to work. Removing the front fascia is quite easy once you've done one. Um, you're going to use those two blue stripes on either side of the machine and give it a little tug towards you and off it comes. Here's the, the naked machine so we can actually see the machine without the cover on. Bottom left is the serial number and the machine type model. Little logo on the bottom right. We've already seen the NME storage at the top in here. I've got the numbering in here from zero to the maximum number which is 15 so there's 16 of them you'll find on this machine everything starts at zero so there's no question about is uh, is it a c1 or the c0 is the first one they're always going to be with the number zero we have the led display blanking plate uh, the cover removed and we have a number of blowers these are uh, fans and they're all present regardless of any configuration inside the machine to remove them, again we press the little blue triangle, the little handle, handle pops out, we grab the handle and turn it around, that disengages the back end of the blower and we pull it out towards ourselves. We'll see that it's a centrifugal fan, this is why we tend to call it a blower rather than a fan, there's no fan blades as you might recognise them. Replacing the blower is the same but in reverse. 
when you come to put the fascia back on, it's more obvious now that you can actually see the clips underneath. The fascia has uh, these little clips that will grab the little rods on the machine with a little knob on the top, and so they will push on and they click on nice and firmly. Let's dive inside now. The first thing you notice is an airflow baffle across the top of the machine, uh, covering the uh, CPUs and, and memory and things. Um, because it's clear, it's difficult to actually see it in pictures and things. I've got a few different angles that may be able to help you out. I also noticed that it's clear in my early machine when the production line starts, they actually, may actually be a uh, different colour. Uh, one example from a previous generation, is I had a clear one, but they actually turned out to be jet black when they arrived at customer site. Here's another angle, main CPUs, memories down in here, but we'll zoom in and see more. Here's more of a really top-down view. At the back, of course, we have the power supplies in the middle and the PCIe adapters there for the taking. So I'll highlight the things in here. In uh, the red, we got all the memory slots, big bank across the middle and then there's a smaller one between the heat sinks and there's a couple on the sides then we have the power tem sockets with their heat sinks on top their dcm dual chip module so underneath each of those blue squares is two power 10 processors in the middle in purple we have the vital product data device we'll talk about that more later uh, at the back or on the right we have the nvme adapter that's running the nvme drives at the front of the machine the top down view there of the eBMC service processor. Now to remove the airflow baffle, on the left hand side there's a little black thing that looks like a handle to me, so that's what I used. On my right hand I'm connecting to a block thing in the middle which is actually just holding it down when the lid is on, but uh, it's good for a handle to lift it up. As it comes up you can see there's uh, quite a complex 3D shape including sort of some bits that go down like this. This makes the airflow go down and actually through the memory rather than going around the top of the memory and the memory getting warm. Looking inside we can see the big bank of memory with their covers on top. There's another bank in the middle and a couple on the left and right of the machine. There's a little clear piece of baffle here. I'm not sure if that will be in the final machines or not but you can't actually see it in my picture apart from I've got my fingers on the top corners. Down in here we've got the green tabs. These are on the one end of the NVMe cables between the adapter at the back and the drives at the front and in green there I've got the arrow showing the various parts of where the OMI memory is sitting. Note that all the memory slots are very clearly numbered. That's good because if you have a failure, rather unlikely, but if you do have a failure, it will tell you which slot you need. And so you make sure you grab the right one to get that replaced. You also have with the blue handles, these things called VRMs or voltage regulator module. This smooths out the electrical power for the memory and the CPUs in particular. They're all running at uh, one volt where we got higher voltage coming off the power supplies like 12 volts and 5 volts. They are actually meant to commit suicide rather than to let a spike through to the more expensive components that they're powering. On the right hand side we have uh, with my uh, pen I'm pointing at the VPD. This is the vital product data that holds the memory and CPU activations along with certain advanced features. Now we're going to look at the memory and I've got a big warning. Power 10 OMI memory requires an IBM custom engineer or an SSR to remove, add and replace this new type of memory. This is different from Power 8 and Power 9. And failure to use a CE or SSR could result in permanent damage to the OMI memory or Probably more importantly, the Power 10 processor that's connected to it, as that's a higher price component. So you'd be warned, don't get it. Now, customers won't be doing this, but let's pretend that you're a CE and you want to know what's going on. The memory has these covers on, partly to keep, keep the, the memory in place, perhaps when it's moving on a lorry or something, or on an aeroplane. Partly, this allows for good airflow through the actual memory. In the S1024, there's different sort of banks of memory. This is the, the long one, there's a slightly shorter one in the middle between the two heat sinks. Note there's an airflow diagram of the front to back, make sure you put it back in the right way. In the right hand side, we're looking down at the slots, you can see the two heat sinks there, and these are the slots the memory actually goes in, completely different to your regular DDR4 uh, memory slots, because these are both faster and more reliable engineering from IBM. Once we've got the cover off, we can actually see the memory cars themselves. You reach in after using your electrostatic earthing strap, of course, 
angles and uh, grab hold of the corners and give it a little pull up it becomes quite easy to do and this is one of the OMI memory cards so I've got a zoom in of the uh, I don't know which one's the top of the bottom I think the top one here is with a copper heatsink on top of one of the components this is the uh, controller for the memory this talks directly to the power 10 processor it's this actual memory controller that's doing all the encryption of this main memory in the computer uh, completely independent of the processes that's not taking up cpu power to actually do the encryption and decryption of the memory now we're looking at the power 10 processor heat sinks uh, there's two of them of course so there's two sockets one under each of these each of that sockets can have up to two power 10 processors aluminium on the top half and uh, copper in the bottom they're probably both alloys but that's what they look like to me don't forget again like the memory uh, ce or an ssr is required to add remove or replace the heat sinks um, and the processor below um, if you do have to go through this process it's quite a quite complicated process for cleaning up with special fluids the actual uh, socket where the processor goes on and uh, talking it down to make sure it's properly seated at the back we're looking from the front to the back this is the power supply and there's a like a metal cage around all the adapters um, RDM doesn't make all the adapters so the idea is I think they will protect the IO from the adapters uh, away from the processors if they're producing electro frequency interference or electrical noise that's all contained in that uh, cage for the PCIe adapters Right, now looking at the back, um, we have, you can see the very clearly C01, blah, 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 all that to 11. And so that is actually 12 slots, but there's only 10 PCIe slots. Uh, the difference being two, one is taken up, it's just not actually a PCIe slot at all. It's here, the BMC or the service processor, and C6 isn't used for PCIe adapters. If you look very carefully at this one, the holes in this one are different to the one next to it. This is a blanking plate, another blanking plate in here. Um, this is the one with the NVMe adapter behind it, and we'll look into that later. Close up on the power supplies, and even closer look up. The Velcro that you have uh, written around the handle is used to capture the power cord. The power cords, if you're going from the top of the rack to the bottom, are quite can get quite long and quite heavy so you're not going to get the power cords uh, slipping out if you've wound the velcro around it and locked it on the little black handle is of course very useful for actually pulling them out you push the blue handle in and then you use the ring to pull it out of the back of course they're taking quite a lot of power so it's quite a lot of copper and a big copper connection at the back so it does take quite a little pull to get them to come out and here we are doing exactly that push the blue and then uh, with the ring pull it out as a combination these are similar power supplies that we've seen in other machines, but uh, higher specifications. On well, the middle of the uh, heatsink tower, we have a nice little label showing you where the different size bolts go in, into, into the planer uh, below. This is these two power 10 heatsinks in here. Uh, this makes sure you don't put a small bolt into a big hole and think you've done it up and it's not actually there. You end up with one big bolt left and you're not sure where it goes. You can actually get them right round square and triangular and which ones go where that's only useful for your typically your ce that's had to dismantle the whole machine to get at some component slightly further down the picture we have a good top view of the ebmc the new service processor if you unplug the cables on the outside you can raise those two blue handles to lift it out I've seen EBMC described as various things this is the actual terminology in the announcement so that has to be right so it's an Enterprise Baseboard Management Controller. This is the voltage regulator module. Uh, reduces those 5 and 12 volt supplies down to 1 that's used by memory and CPUs. Again, we can see a great deal of copper in here. They've got quite high ampage uh, going out of these into the CPU and memory. And this is the first time we've seen voltage regulator modules on a scale out machine. In Power 9, these were built into the uh, planer or motherboard. Uh, now they're separate components so if we do have a problem with one they can be replaced without dismantling the whole machine this is uh putting the vrm back in i forgot to take pictures while taking it out so it slots down into slots of the handles up and then you push the handle handles down lock them both in it together and it goes into the slot nicely nice firm fit air baffle replacement uh, make sure that uh, rubber edge goes through the front in here uh, make sure that this p 
piece here is actually touching the metal inside then you know it's in the right position and there's nothing sticking up over the edge of the server's chassis then you're ready to put the lid on top i commented on the nvme pcie adapter here's a little look at it and unfortunately everything's black on black in the top in here this is the slot with the smaller holes that i pointed out this is the adapter it has a, a wider section at the end i think this is to catch more air for cooling purposes and there's the cables that come out of the back this is them coming out of the back they go uh, this side of the cage and down the side of the machine here they are you can barely see them running along here they, they rise up a bit here and you come to here and uh, then they click onto the side and then they come down to the various NVMe slots which are behind this uh, cover plate uh, here there's also a little little cable in here I'm not sure what it is I think it's a power connector could be wrong and they're connected to the four bays at the front and uh, we've already seen the picture of those before. Just a few little things before we finish. The new eBMC servers processor has the two ports for the HMC, as you'd expect with the previous servers processor. It also has some really great features, include remote graphical user interface access and updating firmware and all sorts of things. So every server needs some IO, Ethernet particularly, and fiber channel probably for big data access. And we asked for something cheap and cheerful because I don't have exotic networks or fiber channels in my lab. And that's exactly what we got. But I had these slides reviewed by Andrew on the Power 10 Scaleout Redbook writing team. And he pointed out the two adapters that I have are not supported on Power 9 Scaleout. That's the 5899 and the 5260. But if you have those in your Power9 servers, you can move them to Power10 and they will be fully supported. So that's bad news and oh, not so bad news. Right then, let's go to the computer room. We need the rack rails with us. Here's a few pictures of them as they're boxed up. We can see the, the two ends in here. This is the front, well it actually says front R for front right hand side. And this is the back, this is the connector where the rack rails clicks into. So it's fairly obvious which is which. Over here, we can see these two uh, knobs in here. If you've got round holes, they'll engage with the round bits, and if they've got square holes, they'll engage with the larger uh, square areas. And there's a little button here that you press to get it into the, the back of the rack. I can honestly say these are the best rails I've seen in 30 years, and IBM rails are pretty good uh, anyway. Lining up with the rail, you can see we've got round hole racks. This is a T42. So the round hole bit is here sticking through. The square bit is still at the back in here. You push this out the way and then you can get the rack rail up to the back here. When you let go, this will clip around in front of the rack and it's locked on. Well, it's clipped on if you like. Uh, you'll put a uh, screw, rather a bolt through here to actually lock it onto the rail nice and firmly. Here that the rail's extended and we can see the, the three holes where they're going to be uh, mounted. These are the <coughs> square head nails as they're called, they're not real nails, uh, where they get locked in here and we've got the unclipping button uh, here and here. Here's the uh, other side of the same thing. This is my uh, new rack for my new equipment. And here is the actual machine in the rack. I don't think it's powered on at the moment. Uh, next thing is cable management arm. Uh, this is optional, uh, makes the machine a bit longer. And uh, we can see these arms going up where we keep all your cables neat and tidy here i am part way through the installation i've got the mains cables on we always put these on first because they're big and brutish compared to fiber channels uh, cables and we, we velcro them down to the bottom of the rack rail and all the lighter weight ones go on top so that when you're bending these around you're not going to break delicate or more delicate fiber channel connectors clips in here and uh, here either side and you look at it and you think how on earth is that going to work and only when somebody else at the front of the machine pulls the machine out you suddenly work it oh yes that's how it works if you get the deck for this video then i've got some extra slides on how we did that with power nine as far as i could tell they're exactly the same as power nine because the power nines were really good and worked very well here's a look at the uh, the front of the machine as big as i can make it um, on my screen and uh, oh a couple of little things bits and bobs so uh, this is the little connector in here which uh, clips in the side for, I think it's exactly the same for the, the S1022 as well. This is a button, so you can press it on to switch the machine on. Um, and then we've got the different indicators here. This is the identification one, I think it's blue. 
Uh, so you can switch that on remotely to make sure that when you're going to replace perhaps a, a disk drive or something, you're actually going to the right machine. You're not off by one rack or off by one in the height in the rack. It's the one that really needs the part removed. Otherwise, you'll be taking out a perfectly good part from a different machine. And then there's the, uh, the warning and error lights as well. This is the LED in the front of the machine. We had a blanking plate. This is a picture from the uh, marketing library um, of the actual unit in here. The idea is you have one of these per rack. They, they cost uh, some money, um, but you don't need one in every one. They're used for uh, diagnostics and changing um, low level settings. I've seen somebody uh, put in an IP address for the service processor. There's only about 200 clicks of the keys going up, down, left and right. And um, quite honestly, it was more of a technical stunt than useful. I just plug mine into the HMC and it sorts it all out on its DHCP network. The nice thing is that if you have one in a rack, then you, and you want to put it on a particular machine, perhaps it's got very low booting problems, so it can't get any other information out there apart from this LCD display. And then you can just pull it out of a running machine and push it into this machine. And then you'll have the low level diagnostics. You may well have dozens and dozens of questions that you want answered at this point while they're all answered in the red book if however you want the performance numbers you have to go and find the performance report i'll put the link in the description of the video i can tell you that the rperf numbers are double that of the s924 so that's the end of this video before i go i'd like to thank the hardware team for developing such fantastic servers and it makes my life easier. ESP team for loaning me the server and the support team behind them, the Hursley Hyperscale Data Center team where the machine is sitting. I'd like to thank all the people on this list and a hundred other names I can't fit in. If you enjoyed this video or learned something, give us a thumbs up. It gives me a good excuse to doing another one. Thanks for watching.